in the UK, we will deter more people from coming here and make such routes unviable. There has been a great deal of misinformation about Rwanda. I visited Rwanda myself several years ago. She's a state party to the 1951 United Nations Refugee Convention and the seven core United Nations Human Rights Conventions. It is a safe and dynamic country with a thriving economy. It has an excellent record of supporting refugees and vulnerable migrants. The UN has used Rwanda for the relocation of vulnerable migrants from Libya, and this was first funded by the European Union. Many migrants, including refugees, have already built excellent lives in Rwanda, and our partnership is a significant investment in that country and further strengthens our relationship. A myth still persists that the Home Office Permanent Secretary opposed this agreement. For the record, he did not. Nor did he assert that it is, a defi it is definitely poor value for money. He stated in his role as accounting officer that the policy is regular, proper and feasible, but there is not currently sufficient evidence to demonstrate value for money. As he would be the first to agree, it's for ministers to take decisions, having received officials' advice. And once the partnership is up and running, he will continue to monitor its efficacy, including value for money. Now, in June, the first plane was ready to relocate people to Rwanda. Our domestic courts, the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court upheld our right to send the flight. However, following an order, the European Court of Human Rights, the flight was cancelled. The European Court of Human Rights did not rule that the policy or relocations were unlawful, but it prohibited the removal of specific people. This was a without notice order, and the UK was not invited to make representations to oppose it. Mr Speaker, as a result, we have been unable to operate relocation flights pending ongoing legal proceedings. However, we have continued to prepare by issuing notices of intent for those eligible for relocation. And my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, recently outlined a comprehensive new approach to illegal migration. Now, a judicial review was brought against the Rwanda Partnership by a number of organisations and individual asylum seekers. The first part of proceedings considered a case that the partnership is unlawful. Part two argued that UK domestic processes under the partnership were unfair, and part three that the policy is contrary to data protection laws. Today, the High Court, in a judgment spanning over 130 pages, 
Lord Justice Lewis and Mr Justice Swift held that it is indeed lawful for the government to make arrangements for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda and for their asylum claims to be determined in Rwanda rather than in the United Kingdom. The court held further that the relocation of asylum seekers to Rwanda is consistent with the Refugee Convention and with the statutory and other legal obligations upon the government, including obligations imposed by the Human Rights Act. Mr Speaker, this judgment thoroughly vindicates the Rwanda Partnership. Yeah. I spoke earlier today with my Rwandan uh, counterpart, the Rwanda Minister Vincent Baruta, and we both confirmed our joint and steadfast resolve to deliver this partnership at scale as soon as possible. It's what the overwhelming majority of the British people want to see happen. The sooner it is up and running, the sooner we will break the business model of the evil gangs and bring an end to these illegal, unnecessary and unsafe channel crossings. Now that our courts have affirmed its legality, I invite the opposition to get behind this plan. And I commend this statement to the House. I call the Shadow Home Secretary of Ecclefer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government has failed to stop criminal gangs putting lives at risk and proliferating along our borders. They failed to prosecute or convict the gang members, and they failed to take basic asylum decisions, which are down by 40 per cent in the last six years. And instead of sorting those problems out, they have put forward an unworkable, unethical, extremely expensive Rwanda plan, which risks making trafficking worse. Yep. Now, the Home Secretary describes today's court judgment as a vindication. I have to wonder whether she has read it, <laughs> because it sets out evidence of serious problems in Home Office decision-making, identifies significant financial costs of this scheme, and also very limited numbers of people who will be covered and certainly no evidence that this will act as a deterrent or address the serious problems that we face. The court concluded that the Home Office decision-making in each of the eight cases considered was so flawed and chaotic that those individual decisions have had to be quashed. Literally cases of mixing up evidence and names in individual cases, so they were making decisions on the wrong people. Confusion between teams in Glasgow and in Croydon about who was deciding what and which information should be shared. Evidence of torture and trafficking not considered. And we know, too, that the Home Office attempted to send heavily pregnant women to Rwanda. Now, this is a damning indictment of the decision-making process in the Home Office, which we know isn't working because 98 per cent of the small boat arrivals in the last 12 months have had no decision at all. And where government ministers seem to have effectively decided they are so incapable of getting a grip on the asylum system and taking asylum decisions effectively here in the UK, they want to pay a country halfway across the world to take those decisions for us. Yeah. Now, on the lawfulness of the decision, the court accepted that Rwanda doesn't have asylum processing capacity, including interpreters or legal support, to take these decisions, but it's concluded the agreement is still lawful because of two key things that the number of people Rwanda takes will be very limited and that there will be lots more money provided by the UK government. The Home Secretary didn't tell us about any of those things. Mm. So can she now tell us yeah. how many people does she expect yeah. to send to Rwanda how next many? year? Rwanda has said it can accommodate 200 people. That is 0.5% of this year's channel crossings. The Home Office itself has said there's no evidence it will act as a deterrent and that it is unenforceable and has a high risk of fraud. Secondly, can she tell us the full cost? The court said there will be significant additional funding provided. The government's already written Rwanda two cheques this year, one for £120 million, another this summer for £20 million. Millions more are promised. So how much more? And how much is this going to end up costing per person? Because it looks like over a million pounds per person at the moment. And third, the court judgment says there's no evidence the UK government sought to investigate either the terms of the Rwanda-Israel agreement or the way it had worked in practice. Why on earth not? 
because that agreement was abandoned with evidence that it had increased trafficking and the activity yeah. of yeah. criminal gangs. Yeah. Convictions yeah. for people smuggling have already dropped by 75% in the space of two years. Convictions for people trafficking are already pitifully low, and a former Chief Constable has warned the Borders Act will make that worse. Yeah. Time and again, the, criminal, the government is failing to tackle the criminal gangs who are driving this or to make them pay the price. So instead of this unworkable, unethically, ex unethical, extortionally expensive and deeply damaging policy, the government should be using this investment to go after the gangs who are putting lives at risk. Yeah. Time and again, all they are doing is chasing headlines, and these are distractions, damaging distractions from the serious hard work to tackle the gangs and sort out the asylum system. The Home Secretary has said that the Conservatives are in last chance saloon. Mm. It is their policies that have put them there yeah. and that have let the country down, always ramping up the rhetoric, never doing the serious hard work or common sense. Britain deserves better than this. Britain is better than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Secretary. Yeah. I'm very disappointed by the response from the Shadow Home Secretary and more actually concerned that she's actually seeking to go behind what is a legitimate decision by our independent judiciary, set out rigorously, exhaustively, thoroughly, and suggests that this is still uh, an illegitimate scheme. We've seen through this uh, judgment that this is now lawful on several grounds. The judgment looked at the legislative authority. It looked very closely about the claims as to whether it breached Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Article 14 of the ECHR, Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. It looked very closely about whether it was fair and uh, uh, or whether access to justice was respected. It looked very closely at other public law grounds. And on all of those claims, the Home Office won. The court concluded that it was lawful, that it is lawful for the government to make arrangements for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda and for their asylum claims to be determined in Rwanda rather than the UK. And that judgment is a comprehensive analysis of the reasons why. The Honourable Ryan Roulet does ask about the eight individual cases, uh, and we, have, we accept the judgment of the court on those individual cases. We have already taken steps to strengthen the case working process, including by revising the information and the guidance given to individuals during their assessment for relocation. But we have been clear throughout that no one will be relocated if it is unsafe for them, and support is offered to individuals throughout the process to ensure that it is fair and robust. But, Mr. Speaker, the simple truth here is that Labour have opposed every one of our efforts to deter illegal migration. They've opposed the Nationality and Borders Act. They've opposed life sentences against people smugglers. They've opposed the removal of foreign national offenders, including drug dealers and rapists. All they offer is obstruction and criticism and performative politics of opposition and magical thinking. Because what, what do they actually offer? They say return to the failed Dublin scheme, no matter that it was ineffective, no matter that the EU doesn't want it. They want safe and legal routes as the answer, no matter that this government has done more than any other in recent history, yeah. offering sanctuary to over 450,000 people by safe and legal routes, no matter that they can't actually define what routes they would stand up themselves, no matter that our capacity is not unlimited, Mr Speaker, and that there are over 100 million people displaced globally. Would Labour give them all a safe and legal route to the UK? Mr Speaker, we cannot indulge in fictions. The fundamental reason that Labour can't articulate a plan is that they can't be honest. They can't be honest with the British public about what they really want. The Shadow Home Secretary couldn't even decide if she would repeal illegal entry, even though she voted against it. Their solution would be to turn our crisis of illegal migration into a crisis of legal migration. Open borders by the back door. Unlimited safe and legal routes is simply open borders masquerading as humanitarianism. Mr Speaker, 
Last week, the Prime Minister and I announced our plan to tackle small boats. Today, the court affirmed the legality of a central piece in that plan, and tomorrow, Mr Speaker, Labour still won't have a plan. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Although the High Court ruled that the Rwanda policy is lawful, there were, as has been said in that case, only eight asylum claimants. Those cases have been all set aside by the court because it, they said at the same time in their ruling that the circumstances of each claimant had not been considered properly. The latest Home Office website figures currently show that there are over 160,000 such individual cases outstanding. Furthermore, as the Home Secretary, in whom I have the greatest confidence, st stated, the European Court judge who issued the injunction clearly did so without proper consideration of the Rwanda policy, and such rulings do not command our respect. Does my right honourable friend accept that for all these reasons it becomes more essential than ever to apply the notwithstanding formula to the new legislation which the Prime Minister has now announced from mid-January, which must also distinguish in our own law between genuine refugees and illegal economic migrants, not only in the interests of saving life, but also preventing organised criminality, but in also asserting UK parliamentary sovereignty overriding the European Convention and at the same time dealing comprehensively with the current backlog of those 160,000 outside outstanding asylum cases in that legislation. Secretary. Well, my honourable friend makes a very important point and what I want to be clear about is that the European Court of Human Rights did not rule on um, the lawfulness of our policy. It did not rule that the policy or relocations were unlawful, but it did nonetheless prohibit the removal of the individuals on the 14th of June flight via uh, interim and injunctive relief. We have a proud tradition of defending fundamental rights in this country, and this, we will always retain a robust approach to protecting uh, and preserving human rights. However, that does not mean that we will, be, uh, 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 we will have a migration system that can be abused and exploited by those who do not have legitimate claims to be here. Uh, and as the Prime Minister announced last week, we will be bringing forward legislation to ensure that we have a robust migration system and secure borders. Yeah. SNP spokesperson Alison Poulos. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a dark day indeed uh, this, with this judgment, and particularly when the Home, of, the Home Secretary come here, comes here to imply that having morals is fanciful. Enver Solomon of the Refugee Council has called this decision wrong in this policy wrong in principle and unworkable in practice, and I am certain that this will go to appeal, as the charities and those involved uh, in it have uh, stated. In the SNP benches, we will never get behind this policy, not in our name. And I remind people in this House that slavery, apartheid and marital rape were all lawful at one time, but none of them were right. The Court found that the Home Office failed to consider properly the circumstances of the eight who challenged this policy. So can I ask the Home Secretary how exactly, the Home Sec how exactly she will intend to approach these cases now? What happens to these, uh, these eight individuals? What happens also to the others uh, who have already been issued with notices of intent? What confidence can they have in a system that didn't, co that didn't properly consider the cases of eight people previously? The Home Secretary claims that this will be a deterrent. Well, the Tories also claimed that the hostile environment would be a deterrent, that the Nationality and Borders Act would be a deterrent, and now the Rwanda policy will be a deterrent. None of them are working because they fail to recognise the very desperate circumstances that drive people to come here in the first place. Safe and legal routes will work and will prevent people being, losing their lives in the Channel. The Home Secretary in her statement talked about the trade in human cargo, and we all want to tackle the people smugglers that exploit people uh, in the most vulnerable of circumstances. But I ask her, what else is this policy, this Rwanda policy, but state-sponsored people trafficking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask her how many people are actually going to be removed to Rwanda? It's going to be a tiny, tiny proportion, and therefore any deterrent effect that they claim is not going to be proper. Um, can I ask her the total cost, lastly, of this scheme as well, this unworkable scheme? Because how much money 
has been spent on it already? How much of it has gone in the legal case? And how much would it have been better spent dealing with the catastrophic backlog of cases that the Tories have created? Yeah. Um, Secretary. Well, I'm afraid that the Honourable Lady's ideological zeal is blinding um, and preventing her from taking a rational approach. I'm very proud of the fact that we've welcomed 450,000 people through safe and legal routes to this country since 2015. And I don't think anyone can claim that we aren't forward-leaning on, on all of this. And I think that the Honourable Lady and her party really needs to be honest about their position with the British people. They stand for open borders and uncontrolled migration. Jacob rees Mr Deputy Speaker, Parliament has legislated, our courts have ruled. We are apparently stopped by a Russian judge woken from a bar to issue an injunction. Can, can this stand? Well, as always, my right honourable friend makes a very powerful point, and uh, I would just say that I, uh, the Prime Minister, neither the Prime Minister or I are, de are deterred from delivering upon this policy. It's an essential part of our wider plans to break the business model, to stop illegal migration. We have a legitimate basis for it. It has been upheld after being rigorously tested in our courts. We will continue to move quickly in order to honour the will of the British people. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Home Secretary says that Britain has a proud tradition of supporting asylum seekers. That is true in part, but it's not true under her tenure. Yeah. She is pursuing a vile policy which is brutal towards the individuals concerned and continually tells us that it is illegal to seek asylum. It is not. It is clearly there in all international conventions. Will she for once? have a sense of humanity towards people who are desperate and are victims of wars, of environmental change, of human rights abuse, and exploited it to, to boot. Cannot she just hold out a hand of friendship and understanding towards these desperate people, rather than this brutal assertion she's making today? The Right Honourable Gentleman keeps talking uh, on a regular basis about safe and legal routes as being a means to uh, an end of illegal arrivals, but the reality is that our safe and legal routes already have allowed 450,000 people to come here since 2015, 300,000 in the last year alone, the highest number that we've seen in several decades. But that needs to happen in conjunction with deterrent policies if they are to have any effect and if we are to stop the practice of people taking lethal and unlawful journeys across the Channel, jumping the queue, undermining the British people's generosity and breaking the law. Yeah. Edward Lee. While this judgment uh, is welcome, it won't solve the problem, not just because of the relatively few numbers that can be deported to Rwanda, but because each case must be fought individually and human rights lawyers will fight every single case individually. That is the problem. Surely the only serious way we can deter migration across the Channel is to have the legal right not just to process people when they arrive on our shores, but to arrest them and detain them until their asylum application is dealt with. Now, is there anything in the Refugee Convention which stops us doing that? If there isn't, why aren't we doing it? And if it's a Human Rights Act that stops us doing it, can we not apply in our new legislation for a notwithstanding clause to deal with that problem? Well, um, we, this is exactly why the Prime Minister announced last week and I and uh, the Immigration Minister are working intensively to prepare legislation which will be introduced next year um, and, that, uh, and it will uh, deliver a scheme along the lines of what he's just described whereby if you come here irregularly or illegally, uh, i.e. on a small boat, uh, putting yourself and others at risk, you will be detained and you will be swiftly removed to a safe third country or to Rwanda for your asylum claim to be processed. Kevin Jones. The uh, Home Secretary, in her statement, confirmed that the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office had concerns about the cost and that she overruled him. 
Now, we've spent £140 million so far, and not one single individual has been uh, removed. When the Honourable Member for Corby was the Immigration Minister, he said that the average cost of, of removing people would be £12,000. Some it was not based on any fact. So if she's so confident about the scheme, she took a decision to overrule the Permanent Secretary. Will she not today publish all the costs uh, of, of this scheme uh, so that we can all take a view of whether it is good, uh, a good use of taxpayers' money or whether it's not just simply a way of fulfilling one of her weird dreams? The Honourable Gentleman needs to get his facts right because actually the, uh, the policy was, the agreement was struck between my predecessor, the right -on friend, my, my right hon friend, the member for Whitham, uh, and the Rwandan government. Um, but I support the work that she did and the achievement that she struck, which is that, she, uh, that the agreement it represents a long term policy. It's expected to last for at least five years, and the costs and the payments will depend on the number of people relocated, the timing of when that happens, and the outcomes of the individual cases. Of course, we've been held up by litigation, uh, and once the litigation process comes to an end, we will move quickly to deliver it and deliver value for money. Yeah. Natalie Elphick. Um, I, I am saddened that following last week's tragic events, neither the Shadow uh, Home Secretary or the SNP Labour front, uh, sorry, SNP front bench are prepared to actually say that people should not be getting into these boats in the first place. They should be claiming refuge and asylum in the one of the 149 Convention countries, many of which they will have gone through. I, I, um, I, I welcome uh, today's judgment um, from the High Court, but I ask my right honourable friend that isn't it even better than Rwanda that people stay safe on land in France and do not take these crossings in the first place? Secretary. My honourable friend is absolutely right. People should not be making this journey. Uh, they should not be crossing through other safe countries. Uh, and they shouldn't be choosing to come to the United Kingdom by these means. Uh, and the sooner that we are able to deliver a policy that reflects that, the better. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The courts have been very clear. It is wrong to have a blanket approach to the treatment of refugees, just as it would be wrong to decide that everybody caught speeding could never drive again. What matters is treating each case on its merits. Now, we've seen already how poorly this government is treating children who are here who are refugee children. The Home Secretary talks about being honest, so let's finally have some honest, straight answers. For avoidance of doubt, will the Home Secretary confirm whether or not she is intending to deport children or those who are looking after children who are here who are refugees to Rwanda? Yes or no? Will children be on those flights, Ministers? Well, we've been very clear that families are not subject to the Rwandan policy. But the broader point is this. There is a, she takes a different reading of the judgment uh, than I do. There's been an extensive and exhaustive analysis of the legal claims brought against the government. Um, and the court has been pretty emphatic on the legality of the policy. Uh, it's concluded that the uh, scheme is compliant with our ECHR uh, obligations and with our refugee uh, obligations. Sir John Whittingdale. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I tell my rightable friend that two months ago I visited Hope Hostel in Kigali, where not only was the accommodation of a high standard, but the Rwandans I spoke to expressed their hope that those coming would in due course obtain jobs and move out to their own homes, thus allowing more refugees to come and take their place. So does she not agree that this policy is not just lawful, it is also humane in that it offers refugees a real hope? Absolutely, and he is reiterating a point which is extensively dealt with in the body of the judgment. Okay. And I refer honourable members and um, members to that judgment, where there is a complete uh, analysis of the exact kind Good of. Break. Well, as the justices make clear at the beginning of their judgment, they are not opining on the politics or the morality of the Rwanda scheme. They are uh, simply opining on the lawfulness, and that's why I have huge confidence in the judgment that's just been handed down today. But if we're talking about 
the broader issues. I mean, I gently disagree with the Honourable Lady, as you would imagine. I, d I think what's actually unacceptable is that her party is peddling uh, a mistruth to the British people. It's saying that we can have an unlimited and open borders policy, and we have unlimited capacity, and everybody's welcome. Unfortunately, the reality, the reality is that is not the case, and we have to take a pragmatic, measured and compassionate approach to our migration, and that's what's sensible and required by the British people. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, central to solving the crisis of illegal migration is the prevention of further loss of human life in the English Channel. So not only do I welcome today's judgment, but my right honourable friend's commitment in her statement to deliver the Rwanda partnership at scale and as soon as possible. But it is clear that there will be continued, continued legal challenges to it, either on an individual basis or on a whole policy basis. So can I push the Home Secretary further on the point made by my rightable friend for Stone that the legislation coming in the new year that I look forward to supporting really must include a notwithstanding clause to ensure that we can prevent that loss of further human life yeah, in the Channel. Yeah. 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 What, what's essential is that we uh, introduce, uh, consider and pass legislation that will be uh, robust uh, and resilient and actually deliver upon our stated political objectives. That will require an exhaustive analysis of the legal methods, but simply put, we're in the process, uh, we're in the sausage machine, as they would put it, so it's not a pretty sight, but uh, nothing is off the table. Yeah. Yeah. Antonia Azzi. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Home Secretary said over the weekend that she is considering leaving the European Convention on Human Rights in order to prevent people claiming asylum. Is it possible, Mr Deputy Speaker, to do this without breaking our commitments in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Mm. Mm. Good question. I think what's clear is that there are uh, evident challenges with the way in which international conventions and agreements relating to migration are working in the 21st century. I think there are legitimate questions that at the international level all nation states are grappling with. I've seen that firsthand when I've spoken to my counterparts at the Calais Group or other international partners. There is a, a, an unprecedented scale of illegal migration. There are, is unprecedented pressure on domestic resources. And I think looking at how we can forge a new uh, uh, set of agreements to work better together is definitely a reasonable approach. Sir Desmond Swain. Were more safe and legal routes to be made available, they would quickly be taken up and the trade in small boats would then continue unabated, wouldn't it? Yes. Ben. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could the Home Secretary clarify for the House? If someone arrives on uh, the shores at Dover to claim asylum in order to be able to join a child, a spouse, or an elderly parent here in the United Kingdom, right to family life, can she assure the House that that individual would not be put on a plane to Rwanda and separated from their family for the rest of their lives? Okay, the reality is that anybody arriving here uh, irregularly will be um, eligible for consideration. We will it, consider every case on its individual merits. Uh, we have excluded families from the scheme, uh, but we will also ensure that the, uh, the, the, the decisions are made on a lo lawful and rational basis. Because. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> The, uh, I, I very much welcome the uh, ruling today and, and the comments of, of the Home Secretary. And it's quite clear from what we're hearing from members opposite that there's a great gulf uh, between uh, their views and the, uh, the vast majority of the British people. <laughs> Overwhelmingly, my constituents want, want to see the uh, Ho Home Secretary and the Prime Minister's proposals implemented as quickly as possible. In particular, there is genuine concern about the speed of uh, processing uh, the many cases. And although uh, additional staff are being taken on, the pitiful number of, ca of cases they're dealing with on a weekly basis needs to be dr dramatically 
quality improve? Can my right honourable friend assure me that action is being taken to ensure that happens? And Secretary. Processing asylum claims is one core element of solving the challenge uh, more broadly, and that's why it's right that we're increasing the number of case workers, increasing their specialism, streamlining the process, because ultimately we want to bear down on the numbers of people waiting for a decision from the Home Office. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Home Secretary says she's taking a deterrent approach. But it's plain that today's judgment cannot and will not function as a so-called deterrent, since the whole point of this vile policy of expelling asylum seekers to Rwanda is that expulsion was supposed to happen automatically and rapidly for anyone without a prior permission to come here via a, a refugee scheme. But today's High Court judgment found that each and every individual case must be assessed first, so there will be nothing automatic about it, and under this government there will be nothing rapid about it either. So will she put a permanent end to this useless cruelty? provide safe and legal routes and ensure that such routes actually function, because the one from Afghanistan currently doesn't. And will she stop saying that this policy has the support of the British people? There is a recent poll from YouGov that shows that just 10 per cent actually support this. The British people are better than this vile British government. Well, I think that um, the reality is that uh, we are supported in taking control over our borders. That was reflected in the 2016 referendum, endorsed in the 2019 referendum uh, uh, election. And, and we have made clear that we will do whatever it takes to ensure we, get, uh, uh, we make progress on stopping illegal migration. We uh, bring an end to people taking this lethal journey, and ultimately re we restore integrity to our immigration system. Tom Hunt. I welcome the judgment today. I find it deeply frustrating though, that just one isolated judge can delay this process for around six or seven months. Um, will the Home Secretary give me some sense of a time scale as you've had today's judgment? When are the first flights going to take off? That is what we all want to see, and that's where my constituents will begin to rest easy when they can see those flights taken off. And also, finally, um, we will probably have to strike agreements with other countries. Um, can the Home Secretary assure me that when we do strike agreements with other countries, they are not delayed in the same way that this one has been delayed, and we don't go through exactly the same motions again, which take oh so long? Well, um, it's, he, he's, he's right that you know, we've always maintained that this policy is lawful, and that today the court has upheld that. We know that there are further legal challenges that are possible, and we will continue to vigorously defend this in the courts going forward. But uh, once the litigation process has come to an end, we will move swiftly to be in a position to operationalise it and deliver on our promise. Joanna Cherry. Deputy Speaker, can I just caution the Home Secretary gently against getting too overexcited about a decision at first instance? Mm -hmm. um, often important constitutional decisions at first instance are overturned on appeal. Think of example for recently uh, when uh, the last Prime Minister but one unlawfully prorogued Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think an appeal here is inevitable. And in the meantime, <coughs> removals to Rwanda can't take place because of the interim measures issued by the European Court of Human Rights. And maybe she'd like to explain to some of her backbenchers the concept of an interim order issued by a judge sitting alone to preserve the status quo, which happens, I believe, in English law regularly by way of injunction. Yep. But my question to her is this. She seems to be implying that she will obtemper the order of the European Court of Human Rights, which, of course, was issued under Article 13 of the Convention, which the United Kingdom is bound by. But I know she's not a great fan of the Convention, and a lot of her backbenchers are asking her about this notwithstanding clause. So can I ask her this? Is it her intention to domestically legislate her way out of our international treaty obligations? Here, here, here. Well, um, it's not appropriate for me to speculate on the response of the claimants or whether there will be any uh, subsequent appeals um, following today's judgment. We welcome today's findings and we will vigorously defend any appeal on the substantive matters of the lawfulness of the policy. Uh, 
We've been clear that in uh, designing and introducing our legislation next year, we will have to ensure that it is sufficiently robust to, uh, to, to promote a scheme that, uh, that means that if you are arriving here illegally, you will be detained and you will be swiftly removed to a safe country uh, for your asylum claim to be processed. Philip Holobane. Ettering welcome the High Court judgment and want to see these relocation flights to Rwanda take off as soon as possible. They will be very concerned to hear today that this could be subject to further judicial delay. Could the Home Secretary outline to my constituents in Kettering how long she anticipates that judicial delay will be? And when can I tell my constituents that the flights will take off? Well, the reality of litigation is that uh, there are always that there are appeal rights. There is a hearing on the 16th of January at which the claimants and the Home Office will make representations regarding uh, any applications to appeal. The court will decide the next steps, uh, if any, in UK litigation. We are currently considering the UK's um, the Home Office's position um, uh, uh, with my legal team, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss what our strategy is in the meantime. But uh, yes, there is a hearing on the 16th of January to consider uh, appeal applications. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, the Right Honourable Lady uh, tries very hard to find the way forward on a solution. Whilst I absolutely acknowledge and defer to the High Court ruling, I say this with great respect to the Right Honourable Lady. Uh, what is clear is that we have a duty of care, and I believe, along with many others in this nation, in this House today and outside of this House, do not believe that this scheme fulfils our moral obligation. So can the Secretary of State again confirm that should another way of dealing with the current situation is identified, better regulation in this channel, uh, better processes in France? more acceptable or extra ways of migration for those who wish to, and, and there will be others, that this will be given con consideration, as I d do believe that there has to be a more compassionate approach that can be taken. Here, here. I think the solution uh, involves a multifaceted approach, and that's why we are working very closely with the French. And I was very pleased to strike an agreement last month with my French counterpart to bolster our co cooperation on the channel. Uh, information and intelligence sharing uh, for the first time ever, UK border force officials working hand in hand with our French counterpart counterparts in France. That's why I've also uh, worked closely with other interior ministers from European nations on this similar issue. That's why we need to work on our asylum backlog. That's why we need to uh, uh, introduce legislation. The Rwanda scheme is one element of a very uh, multi-dimensional programme, uh, uh, and I think we need all elements to work in tandem. Jack Brereton. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Home Secretary knows, Stoke-on-Trent has already done more than our fair share, and this has put huge pressure on our local public services. So would my right hon. Friend agree that it's really important that we get on now with delivering this policy and get on with those flights as soon as possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, I pay tribute to him and his uh, Stoke parliamentary colleagues, the local authorities, and uh, all of those involved in supporting asylum seekers in Stoke. And I, uh, and I know that there is a high number of people currently accommodated uh, in, in, his, uh, in his area. Uh, it is therefore vital that we stop people coming in the first place, and delivering the Rwanda partnership is key to making that happen. And Kaiser. Deputy Speaker, it's the super rich and those on luxury yachts, not small boats, that people should be scared of. Asylum seekers are people just like us. They have hopes, dreams and aspirations. This policy could be legally sound, but it's immoral and a waste of taxpayers' money. This cruel government should be ashamed of themselves. The Home Secretary in her statement said, this judgment thoroughly vindicates the Rwanda partnership and that it's what the overwhelmingly majority of the British people want to see happen. Of course, the Rwanda partnership wasn't in the Tory manifesto. So can she evidence this support that people across all four nations want the Rwanda deal because Scotland said certainly doesn't, and Scotland will continue to reject these xenophobic policies. Well, the, the reality is, is that actually 
uh, stopping people taking the journey in the first place is the compassionate and pragmatic approach. It delivers for the British people, but it also sends a message to those people smugglers, human traffickers, and those who are deliberately taking the journey to come here for illegitimate means not to do so. That's the sensible approach going forward. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, could I welcome the judgment today that confirms the government's policy is legal and will be a step forward to implementing what the Prime Minister said last week. The Home Secretary is right that we need to destroy the, the, break the business model of the people smugglers. Does she agree with me that it's not enough just to go after the supply, even though those people are immoral and parasitic? We need to destroy the demand for these journeys in the first place. And the way we'll achieve that is by making clear that those that come by boat won't be allowed to stay in this country. That's what worked in Australia. That's what will work here. Yeah. He's absolutely right, and I've met with Australian officials who were involved in the design of their sovereign borders programme, and they say uh, very much that, that actually once they were able to remove illegal entrance to Papua New Guinea or Nauru, they saw a dramatic change in the numbers of people attempting the journey in the first place, uh, and that's the model upon which our Rwanda scheme is based. Yeah, yeah. Stuart if every country took this government's approach, this Rwanda approach, the countries who already host the overwhelming majority of refugees, the Jordans, the Lebanons, the Pakistans, the Ugandas of this world, the first countries, they would instead be required to host all of them, while wealthy Western countries like the United Kingdom could pick and choose if and when they wanted to help out. What this government is arguing for is a ve the end to the international system of refugee protection, is it not? Well said. Of course it is. I really um, disagree with the moral high ground that my honourable friend seems to be taking here. In light of Scotland's paltry record in taking asylum seekers, they've refused to take anybody who's come here on a small boat. And that, Mr Speaker, is unacceptable. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome uh, the statement today and the judgment. But will uh, the Secretary of State confirm to this House that she will continue to use every tool in her power to stop these boats. As you can see, the opposition and there will be the human rights lawyers who will try and stop what the, the good work that the Secretary of State is doing, because the people of Doncaster are tired of being taken advantage of by these illegal immigrants. So will she confirm to the House that she will continue to use everything, every power that she has? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend not only speaks for the people of Doncaster, but he speaks for the people of Britain uh, in his question there and expressing the sentiment that the British people are tired uh, and they want this problem to be fixed. It's only this government that's going to do it. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. How many of the people who were pulled from the Channel last week does she think should be sent to Rwanda? They wouldn't be. Well, uh, the incident last week was tragic. People died. Precious human lives were lost. Uh, people had been exploited and took a journey which was unlawful and lethal and, in the end, tragic. That's what we want to bring to an end. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The court found that the Home Office would have to consider asylum seekers' particular <coughs> circumstances before deporting them to Rwanda. Does the Home Secretary acknowledge that this defeats the purpose of this scheme, where the original intent was to have applications assessed in Rwanda under Rwandan law, and as such, will she reconsider? Well, the, the, the judgment is very clear that our arrangement, which means that people will be relocated to Rwanda for their asylum claims to be processed, uh, and then they will be resettled uh, there, that has been found to be lawful, and there has been an extensive analysis of all the potential legal claims that could render that unlawful, uh, and the Home Office has won. I see the end of that statement. I would like to thank the Home Secretary for her statement today and responding to questions for over 50 minutes. We are now moving on to the next statement, which is on the Convention on Biodiversity, COP15 Outcomes. And I call Therese Coppe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With your permission, I would like to update the House on the outcome of COP15 of the Convention on Biodiversity, which was held in Montreal, and from which I have just returned. For too long, nature has been overlooked, the Cinderella of the story. But flora and fauna are important in and of themselves. Nature is both the essential foundation and a powerful engine for our economies. 
and helping nature recover is one of the most effective, cost-effective ways we can tackle so many challenges, including the causes and impacts of climate change, thirst, hunger and health, and bolstering peace and prosperity. Early this morning, the world came together to secure the strong, ambitious global framework we need to catalyse a decade of environmental action on the scale of the Paris Agreement as for climate, putting nature firmly on the map. The agreement includes global targets to protect at least 30% of the world's land and at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030, and to see natural systems restored, populations of species recovering and extinctions halted. It includes reporting and review mechanisms that will hold all of us to account for making timely progress on bringing our promises to life. And it includes commitments on digital sequence information to make sure communities in nature-rich countries feel the benefit of sharing the solutions that we know their flora and fauna can provide. Behind the scenes, over, very, over many months now, we've been working with Ecuador, Gabon and the Maldives to develop the credible 10-point plan for financing biodiversity during this decade that played a critical role in getting this agreement over the line by giving nature-rich countries confidence in our collective willingness and ability to secure the investment needed to protect natural wonders on which their people, and in many cases, the whole world, depends. And on the back of those efforts, public, private and philanthropic, philanthropic donors committed billions of dollars of new investment in nature. The agreement itself includes commitments to create a new international fund for nature, to increase investment in nature from all sources to $30 billion a year by 2030, and to accelerate the vital shifts that are already underway to make sure that our economies underpin our survival and our success. And I want to thank our team of ministers and pay tribute to all our UK civil servants from across government, as well as world-leading scientists from a range of British institutions, including Kew Gardens and JNCC. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've been on this journey since the last CBD COP14 that I attended in Egypt in 2018. And in meetings with delegations from around the world, time and again, we heard praise for the way our world-class UK negotiators helped to broker this agreement. We know from experience here in the UK that when we set ambitious targets, what we see is an acceleration of action to meet them across government sectors and communities. And that is why we have worked so hard to secure these global targets. And just before I set off for Canada, I announced that we have taken the next steps towards leaving the environment in a better state than we found it. We're putting in a set of new stretching domestic targets into UK law under the Environment Act on air, water and waste, as well as nature, land and sea to improve the state of the environment in our country. These targets will be challenging to meet, but they are achievable. And the global coalitions of ambition that we have been leading, co-leading and supporting will now shift towards supporting implementation of the new International Nature Agreement as well. Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, the UK is committed to playing our part now and in the months and years ahead. And while no country can solve this alone, if we work together to make this a decade of action, we stand not just to avoid the worst impacts, but by securing the abundance, diversity and connectivity of life on Earth to build a better future for every generation to come. And I commend this statement to the House. Sir so Bell? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of her statement. The agreement signed in Montreal this morning to protect 30 per cent of the planet for nature and restore 30 per cent of the planet's degraded ecosystems is welcome news. That we are to protect a minimum of 30 per cent of land and 30 per cent of our seas is a benchmark we must adhere to to avoid ecosystem collapse. I was glad to be part of the UK's delegation to COP15. The Secretary of State used her spot on the global stage to announce the UK's environmental targets, the ones were where she missed her own legally binding deadline in October. I note, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Secretary of State didn't announce the delayed targets to the House first in the proper way, and I think that speaks volumes. We are still to have an oral statement on those targets. It's quite astonishing, then, that after all of the warm world, the Government's own targets do not include a 30% goal of protecting nature. The Secretary of State compared nature to Cinderella, Mr Deputy Speaker. If that's the case, and the members for Camborne and Redruth, North East Hampshire and Suffolk Coastal must be the cruel stepsisters who have neglected her during their time in charge. The Government also failed to include overall measures 
for water quality in protected sites in their targets. The reality of the sector of states watered down targets means our country and our communities will face even more toxic air and more sewage dumping for longer. A cynic's view might be the government is happy to commit to non-legally binding targets in Montreal whilst shirking any real responsibility at home. Ambitious environmental leadership means, at the very least, ensuring clean air, clean water and access to nature. But it doesn't matter how the government tries to dress it up, their targets do not go anywhere near far enough and it's our community that will suffer as a result. Rivers in England are used as open sewers. Not one is in a healthy condition. Only 14% meet good ecological standards. With no overall water quality targets, the Conservatives can continue to allow raw sewage to flow into our natural environment hundreds of thousands of times a year. How does that fit with our Montreal commitments? Only Labour has a proper plan to clean up our waterways. We introduce mandatory monitoring with automatic fines, hold water bosses personally accountable for sewage pollution and give regulators the power to properly enforce the rules. One in five people in the UK with respiratory conditions such as asthma and COPD, which are worsened by breathing toxic air. We know this is especially dangerous for children and vulnerable adults, and I'm extremely concerned at the unambitious targets for air quality set out by the government. Labour committed to tackling this health crisis once and for all with a Clean Air Act, giving the right to breathe clean air, monitoring and tough new duties on ministers to make sure WHO clean air guidelines are kept. Of the 20 UN biodiversity targets agreed to in 2010, the UK has missed 17. 17, Mr Deputy Speaker. When it comes to the environment, the government constantly makes the wrong choices, delay vital action, duck the urgent challenges. Failure to deliver on environment targets at home show their promise at COP15 <coughs> mean very little. The Secretary of State's own colleague at COP, the Lord Goldsmith, described the UK as one of the most nature depleted on the planet. The Environment Act must target on speech abundance, which they were forced to concede by opposition amendments, promised only to halt the decline of speech by 2030. How does that now sit with our Montreal commitments? Mr Deputy Speaker, it's clear from the Secretary of State's watered down environmental targets that the Conservative Government have given up on governing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I've never heard such rubbish from the opposition, oh, yeah. so I'm really quite sad about this. For a start, let's just get it clear. The Honourable Member, was, uh, it was good that he went to Montreal, but he was not a member of the UK Government's delegation, uh, but I'm glad that he went anyway, as did other members. And at the first opportunity, after getting clearance for the targets, I did inform Parliament and a written ministerial statement was laid in the Lords on Friday before uh, I made a short announcement into, uh, into, uh, into uh, where well, I was in Montreal. So in terms of, um, it, I'm very clear, Mr Deputy Sp Speaker, genuinely, this agreement would not have been as strong if it had not been for the efforts of the UK government. Yeah. Even this morning, in the dark hours in Montreal, the text was reopened at our insistence to make sure that the depletion of nature was included in the text of what was agreed. At the same time, we have been working tirelessly day in, day out during this uh, negotiation to make sure that we did secure finances, because I'm very conscious of many nature-rich around, countries around the world need that financial support in order to make sure that uh, nature is restored. Now, in terms of what we're planning to do here in the UK, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, frankly, nature has been depleted ever since, frankly, the Industrial Revolution. That has recently been more recognised. That is why it is this government that put in place the Environment Act. By the way, that builds on a number of Environment Acts which previous Conservative administrations have put into place, recognising the importance of legislation, but also delivery in terms of that. The Honourable Gentleman refers to the air quality target. The only reason why we've kept...